like an eye. Someone with the courage to allow room for big things to run wild. share with you as we're getting started today. Last night at our five o'clock service, um, we were so blessed to welcome in baptism baby Josephine Faye Vasquez. This is a, a cousin of the Kilstad family. Um, and so she was a, she was baptized here um, last night. Yes, you continue to give thanks to God and pray for her in her new life in Christ. Today at all of our services, we are so grateful to have with us Sharon Magnuson. Sharon Magnuson is the mission funding director of the ELCA World Hunger, she's one of the mission funding directors of the ELCA World Hunger and Lutheran Disaster Response. Um, she's here giving a temple talk at all of our services, kind of a little bit of a preview, some basic information. But then immediately following this service today, she'll be offering a, an adult forum class. Um, we are going to, um, it'll be mostly in person, but we're gonna try out some new technology we have also with our Zoom. Um, for those of you who are online with us, we'll be sharing the link to that too. It's our normal adult forum link, um, so you can join us online for that. And she's going to share a little bit more, a little bit of a deeper story about the work that ELCA, World Hunger and Lutheran Disaster Response, are doing around the world. So we'll hear from you in just a minute. I want to thank you for being here with us. At the 8.30 service, she's from Portland, I said, at the 8.30 service, I said, I feel like you brought that Portland weather with us, but the sun's out now, so we're all good, right? Yeah. So we're, thank you for being with us today, Sharon. Um, we do have Sunday school today also. Um, upstairs is our upper grades, so our, our pre-K and K are over in our Sunday school, um, our preschool area, and then the upper grades, first through fifth graders, are upstairs, um, and they'll join us a little bit later for communion. And then this evening, uh, we do have our SALT, uh, St. Andrews Lutheran Teens, only meeting at 5 o'clock uh, for a movie and pizza. It's $4 for pizza. Bring some snacks and some drinks to share. Um, I did put in the group meet for SALT that we're watching a Marvel movie that will not be released until 2027. Um, so we got a lot of complaints that they've already seen the Marvel movie or whatever it was. <laughs> but it was fun to put that out there. So we don't know what we're watching yet. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, so for the week ahead, our Tuesday morning Bible study continues on Zoom this week with Mary Jo. 
Um, so you can let the office know or check, check the box on the back of this blue slip to let us know if you'd like to be a part of that. You can also RSVP on our blue slip for the Berry Family Reception of Remembrance, which is coming up on Saturday, April 2nd. And then we also will be offering a new members class. It's a 90 minute one time <laughs> class. Um, meal, a meal is a part of it. Um, and it will be at 1130 on Sunday, April 3rd. So if you'd like to come learn about membership at St. Andrews, um, you can join us for that coming up. And then of course, let us know how we can be praying for you. We'll collect these um, during our offering time later in the service. And then uh, this Wednesday, our Wednesday evening uh, stuff all begins at 5.15 with yoga outside on the grass. That's at with, 5. At 5. Mm -hmm. um, with yoga out on the grass um, with Sage Walding out there at 5 o'clock. And then uh, dinner starts at 5.15 and Holy uh, is preparing that meal with chicken and, she looks and wild rice soup. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, not. Yeah. <laughs> it's all Lisa this week. I have to work. Okay. She put you on the schedule she this week? She put me on the schedule. To work somewhere else. To work at All right. <laughs> Very good. She's on her own. So it'll be chicken and wild rice soup uh, this week uh, for a wind dinner. Um, that starts at 5.15. And then our confirmation will uh, we'll meet at 5.45 on this side uh, uh, for dinner and a lesson. And then we have our 7 o'clock uh, midweek uh, Lenten service with holding, holding even prayer service uh, at seven o'clock and we'll be hearing this week from Kathy Anderson, our own uh, member here again, um, who is the director for survivors of torture. And then finally, um, out in the courtyard, we wanna invite you to stop by our table and sign up to be a part of our 24 hour prayer vigil. This will be taking place, it's Friday and Saturday, April 8th and 9th, 24 hours of prayer. We're asking for people to submit prayer requests, and then also sign up for 30-minute shifts that you can do either in person or um, through a virtual way um, so you can pray at home. Um, and so you can see um, outside in our courtyard, there's a table out there for you to sign up and participate so that we can begin this, that holy week with this 24 hours of prayer. And that is all our announcements. And I want to invite up Sharon Magnuson, who's going to be sharing her temple talk today, and hopefully uh, many of you can stick around to be a part of her class, which will be after service. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. And as P Pastor Sarah was saying, I'm one of 10 mission funding directors across the country, and I live and work out of Portland. And so I should be traveling here in Southern California regularly, but this is my first visit with you, and it's wonderful to be here. Now, I'm really here to say thank you. You are one of our most generous congregations across the country. And it's been this way for years. I, I don't know your exact giving history, but we can go back to 2005, probably the start of the ELCA. You've been giving generously in leadership since that time. Stand with Africa, the campaign for the ELCA, and now what we're really so grateful for is during the pandemic, it's been an interesting time for, for ministries of the ELCA where designated gifts make those ministries happen, like ELCA World Hunger and Lutheran Disaster Response. So we would say thank you. Again, you're one of our top 300 giving congregations across the country. Most generous. It's wonderful to be with you. Now, how, a little bit about how ELCA World Hunger works. Uh, I love the intention of our church, the integrity, where when you're giving to address hunger and address the root causes of hunger, your gifts are going in, are directed immediately in the year they're given. Now, in 2020, the year of the pandemic, our distribution plan was $21.5 million dollars. And when congregations were not going to be able to worship, have that energy, have that offerings, talk about what gifts do, would we continue to have that trajectory of giving? And somehow, Holy Spirit thing, uh, we had our largest year, our most generous year ever of over $24 million in 2020. And individuals and congregations continue to give more than the year before. 2021 is another great year. Um, wanted to share, I brought some newsletters with me. Our next Lifelines newsletter 
will post our 2021 revenue and distribution. So we want to be transparent. We want to share those numbers. They're big. These gifts are going into the field. Now why? Why does St. Andrews support this ministry? Last night I was reminded that, you know, there's nothing like the energy of members and pastors and that Bishop Andy is home to this congregation, your pastoral team. Uh, it's easy to see that you have leadership, but you have energy and passion within your membership. And so we thank you for that. But I think the pandemic taught a lot of people, reminded us who we are as church. And certainly as Christian denominations, we're here to love our neighbor, to be Jesus. And the churches are effective and efficient. We know how to care for others. And so it was, it's been a great place for investment. And we thank you for modeling that. Now also, what makes us efficient and effective are relationships. And St. Andrews knows this community, your congregation that knows the needs of your neighbors. That's true of our congregations across the country. Internationally, our relationships are through companion churches. A ministry like ELCA World Hunger, we work in 60 countries around the world, more <coughs> companion churches, and it's those relationships that help us move programs, take care of neighbors, and make ministry happen. Now, at this time, we're all focused on um, the crisis in Eastern <coughs> Europe, which for the ELCA is a response through Lutheran disaster response. But it's a great example of how we're already there, we're able to, to be part of the response immediately. The ELCA has personnel and missionaries in four countries that border Ukraine. We're in Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. We have ministries on the ground there through ELCA World Hunger that primarily work with refugees. So we're set up rather beautifully to assist in these times. Our big partners that help us do more are Lutheran World Federation, Action by Churches Together, and Church World Service. This work, these ministries are yours, thanks to your gifts, your support, and your partnership. We cannot thank you enough for being most generous, and uh, it's an honor to work with you. Peace be with you. Thank you, Sharon. And we'll continue now with our call to worship from our band. Thank you. <clears throat>
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing our opening song, Lord, listen to your children praying, and we're also going to listen to children laughing, crying, and then praying again, right? Yep. All right. Last so you, the words and music are in your bulletins. Last one's the intro. One, two, or one, two, three, four. <laughs> from Luke, the 15th chapter. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe the best one, put it on him, 
put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen. For all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, came back, who, was devoured your prop, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because your brother, the bro this brother of yours, was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Doris. I don't think we mentioned in our announcements since our Sunday school, um, but I think you can hear them now. Upstairs. It's good to hear them pounding around up there and enjoying themselves uh, during Sunday school uh, this morning. So this prodigal uh, son story is so well known in our culture that it has become part of our vernacular. The title, The Prodigal Son, has been used in movies and recently uh, in a TV series that had three seasons. For preachers, this story returns to us every three years during this week in Lent. Jesus uses this story as a teaching tool, and we're still learning from this parable 2,000 years later. The prodigal son is the one who leaves and struggles out of sight of his father. And how many of us can relate to this? Because we all want our children to know that we love them. We also want them to be independent, not always have us with them or with us wherever we go. As a parent, I can remember all those first times for our two children we got more and more extended time away without us. It may have been that first time we put them in a crib overnight, or the first time we left them with a babysitter for maybe an hour, or the first time we dropped them off at preschool, or the first day at public school. Each of these have their own drama and emotion involved. But possibly one of the most memorable ones for me was the fall of 89, when my parents left me off at Seattle Pacific University at my dorm. The emotions of my mom as they drove away that day and headed south down Interstate 5 back to Northern California. Or for me as a parent, when we left Isabel at our daughter, UC Santa Cruz, Lisa, her mother, cried as we moved stuff into her dorm room and then cried for well over an hour as we drove south down the 101. And last night, she confessed to me that she was pretty dehydrated and fell asleep because of her crying so long. But in both these cases, it is exactly what parents would hope for their, for their children to gain that independence and succeed. And surely this struggle is a central part of this peril, as Jesus offers wisdom and insight about all kinds of human relationships through parables. Now as I opened this text up this week and began working on this in the sermon, I was particularly interested in the brothers in this story, in the relationship between the two of them, and the division between them. What this parable teaches us is so real and so honest. And if we, if we are honest about it, we can see ourselves in the character of both these brothers. After all, we would all like to be received and 
welcome when we realize we've messed up, a need reconciliation. And who doesn't get upset or even hurt when they get overlooked? When they get overlooked in their daily work, in their effort to do the right thing. The brother who stays at home and in the routine of working for his father, doing everything that is expected of a good son, represents in this story listeners of Jesus who strive to fulfill their religious duties faithfully and who are aware of their belonging to God's people. But Jesus' parable uncovers the pretension of those who consider themselves better than others or who expect to be rewarded for their good attitudes and hard work. And the questions that often come up in Bible studies when this parable is taught is what's wrong with expecting to be rewarded for doing what is right? Is it not fair that the one who strives to do what is right should be recognized for it? Doesn't the son who stayed at home represent the moral values that should guide each of us? Isn't this sort of moral exactly what we teach our children from the time they can speak? Yes, it is. So what's the problem? The problem is that morality can turn into moralism. And that becomes the awakening of division. The effort to do what is right, to comply with the established norms, should not make us so proud that we feel uncomfortable when the father rejoices with the brother who repents and returns to his family and his home. The brother who decides to go out and spend his inheritance represents the opposite type. He just wants to enjoy life. He's not bound by his duties, nor is he concerned about whether or not his attitude actually hurts his father. And of course it does hurt his father. Parents know how hard it is to let children go out into the world. It is good to see our young people stretch out their wings and feel that sense of freedom. However, there are times when parents see their children making poor decisions that will lead them towards selfishness and unhappiness. And in the Bible studies in the past, the questions that have come up with this son are, it's the problem if the child wants to enjoy life and spend everything. He's just doing what he wants and with what is his anyway. And yes, but what's the problem? The problem is that immorality, life without any discipline, leads to failure. It hurts us and hurts those who love us. And once again, Jesus in his parable gives us insight into our own humanity through these two characters, these two brothers. But there is another character that often gets somewhat unnoticed, overlooked. The father of these two very different brothers. He's the one. He's the one that suffers in silence. He responds to the request of his son who wants his independence. He feels the pain of his loss and his worry for that son. And he misses him so much. So much that he runs out to meet him and embrace him and kiss him. And then he gives him more than he asked for and even more than he deserves. And then the older brother displeasure is revealed. And the father takes the initiative to promote reconciliation. The son who returns repentant receives a new opportunity. Having squandered his share of the inheritance, he now depends on the mercy of his father and brother who stayed back at home. And the father is already happy. The father is already celebrating. And the brother still has to deal with his heartache. The father's joy 
will be complete when there is true reconciliation between his two sons, between the brothers. Now our God knows that we can't do this on our own. After all, we have too many doubts, too many fears about others, especially of our enemies, and too much insecurity, too much scarcity, even in our best attempts. It is our God who creates peace, which is why the deep heart of the story is centered on the idea of grace. In the midst of these very real but very flawed characters, Jesus highlights our deep need and desire for acceptance, forgiveness, and love. And Jesus goes on to wander into the wilderness of the world to come and find us, wherever we are, to be with us, and to accompany us in our lives through those beautiful times and those painful times. Jesus' love beckons us towards humility and reconciliation. Jesus even entered the wilderness of death on the cross. So whether we squander this gift or hold it too tightly or too closely, the love of God can't be undone in our lives and in our world because it is the greatest gift of all which none of us can earn. None of us deserve because it's divine grace. It is the grace of the gospel that invites us and feeds us with manna in the wilderness. Thanks be to God.
people of God, now we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue with our prayers, and we do have several prayer requests, and we're asking for prayers of healing for Charlie, this is Keith and Barbara Williams' friend, and for Brad Tabor, Marilyn Duba's son, also for God's mercy for Esther Topia, Mary Thomas's neighbor's mother, and also prayers of healing for Steve O'Leary and Juan Nguyen, who were both recently hospitalized, and then prayers for Michael Smith, the brother-in-law of Kathy Hall, who was admitted Friday um, for severe hip pain. So prayers for correct diagnosis, treatment, and relief of pain. And then finally, prayers of peace and comfort for family and friends and thanksgiving for the life of Eleanor, Diana Osborne's, mo Osborne's mom, and Ruth Showalter, Rick Showalter's mom, who both died recently. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Jesus formed the disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world plagued by fear and condemnation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Countries are divided, and leaders often harbor grudges. Reconcile nations that experience conflict, especially Russia and Ukraine. Act quickly to bring an end to war. Anoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of collaboration among political rivals. Lord, in your mercy. Your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding ministries of every kind, especially Taco, the Cupboard on 54th, Monty and Moe's Food Pantry, and ELCA World Hunger and Lutheran Disaster Response. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing financial hardships. Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving. Console us with the promise that everything can become new. And we pray now for those we know, silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We share a sign of peace. Peace be with you all. Peace to everyone online with us today. Peace be with you. And as we continue now with our offering, I think you all have gotten into the rhythm of it now. Each week um, we have been blessed. A different congregational member has made homemade communion bread with a recipe that's meaningful for them. Um, so this week we want to give thanks to Kurt Bauer who prepared our communion bread and the story that he wrote about it. Um, he created, he baked a form of, it's called Amish bread, and here's the story that he wrote about it. For many, the fragrant aromatics of freshly baked bread, piping hot right out of the oven, evoke fond memories of home. 
When I was a kid growing up in rural Michigan, I remember being immediately comforted from the pleasant scent of homemade bread that greeted me at the door. Either after getting off the school bus and stopping at my grandparents' farmhouse, or that my mom had baked after sauntering a quarter mile down the road when I got home. Unforgettable. My grandma and most of my maternal side belong to a very conservative denomination, Apostolic Christian Church, that I often compare to Mennonite. For those who aren't familiar with either, I affectionately refer to them as, quote, Amish light. And then people get the Waltons-esque notion. So it seemed fitting to make Amish bread for my contribution. It's been five decades since those cozy grade school afternoons of toasty bread slathered with creamy butter. It just, it's so hard for me to read it every time. <laughs> I don't have my mom or grandma's recipes, but the smell, taste, and texture of this recipe I found online stirred up those nostalgic sentiments from forever and a day ago, emotions that have never faded, and I hope they never do. So this will be our Amish bread that Kurt prepared for us for communion today. So just a little bit later, we'll gather around this table and receive the gift of God's grace through this bread. But in the meantime, we'll continue now with the receiving of the offering as together we sing our offering song, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed, blessed us, us with the fullness of creation. creation. Now, now we gather at your feast, feast, where you offer us food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. invite kids up for children's time. If you want to come up here, we have a picture to show you. What is it? We're going to talk about what it is. Come on up. See what you can see. Yes, it's definitely painted. It's a painting. Yeah, you want to see it up close? Good. So now that you're all here, so when you look at this painting, what do you see? What are some a things? Castle. A castle. castle. Oh, well, good. Upside down head. Uh, uh, I saw a person kind of with like an upside down person. Maybe an upside down person, yeah. Ooh, the beach. The beach. Oh, like yeah. a lake here. Oh, this looks like, like it could head. be the beach. 
you see an upside down head? What do you, do you, anyone over here see anything see in the picture? Head. Yeah, what do you see? Oh, someone who's wow. maybe at the end of their life and about ready to go up to mm -hmm. heaven. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else see other things in the picture? They kind of look like arms. They kind of look like arms, yeah. This, one, this part looks like a, a, a current of some sort. Ooh, a current. Or, or possibly a, a snowstorm kind of. Ooh, or a snowstorm. Okay. Now, does it make a difference if you take a couple steps back? Do you see something different if you step a little bit back? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does it make a difference? Okay. Do you see something different now? Okay. So. I see mountains at the top. Ooh, mountains. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little story about this painting. Pastor Manuel and I actually saw this painting when it was being painted. Um, Nick did too. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were at an event where we um, hired a painter to paint this painting, and he painted this painting in four minutes. It was during a song. He painted it in four minutes. And we were watching him, and we were thinking to ourselves, I wonder, we had no idea what he was going to create. And we watched him paint it, and we thought, I wonder what it is he's making. And so he was up there painting, the song was playing, and then what happened was, right at the song was ending, here's what he did. Oh, wow. He flipped it over. Now what do you see? People hugging each other. I see I yeah. see I see a, maybe Jesus holding him. Yeah. See so Jesus holding someone, yeah. I see that too. Yeah. yeah. I was looking at it, I was like, this would make something really cool if you flipped it over. <laughs> so he's <laughs> some saying, it'd be really cool if you flipped that painting over, right? <laughs> Yeah, like an angel or someone that's holding someone. Can you see, what do their faces look like? Do they look like they're happy? Do they look like maybe they're feeling a little worried, right? There's all sorts of different things you see in this picture. Well, we shared this picture with you today because Pastor Manuel, um, he was talking about a Bible story where uh, someone's son decides to leave home. It's the story of the prodigal son. And then he decides he wants to come back home again. And in the story, the dad runs down the road to meet him and then gives him a big hug. And so I think there's lots of different things we can see in this painting, but I saw that particular story in this painting. Do any of you see that maybe in this image? Yeah, flip it over again. Flip it over? Oh, okay. <laughs> flip it over again. Yes, ma'am? I think upside down works. Yeah, that's oh, his yeah. signature. Yeah. That's his signature. Okay, I now, should we have the magic moment again? Okay, let's, oh, it's magic, look at that, wow, right? So, but I also, when I look at this, I think, oh my gosh, there are times in my life where this has been maybe how I feel. This looks like fireflies. Oh, like fireflies, yeah. And I thought maybe this is how I feel and how grateful I feel that God's love and embrace in times in my life when I felt like what is maybe it? I needed a hug. Neck? Where's his neck? What is it really supposed to be, though? It is, well, it's supposed to be someone hugging someone else. But I, I personally, I definitely feel like this could be Jesus for sure. But, you know, that's the thing about art. When you look at it, maybe it tells a story to you that you see in something, you know, and someone else, they see a different story. That's kind of a cool thing about art. Okay, so we're going to say a prayer. And then you're welcome to stay up here um, because then we're going to continue with communion. You're welcome to stay up here during the words, words around communion. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your loving embrace for us and for the different ways we experience your love and care and hugs. And we thank you for these children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Pastor Man is going to take that. You all can, you're all welcome to sit down up here for a minute because we're going to continue with communion. You can see that bread up close. And so we remember in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Do you remember what he says next? Yes, this is my yes. body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. All right, you all can head back to your seats. We do want to welcome you all to communion this morning. You don't need to be a member of this church or Lutheran. All are forward. All are welcome to come forward, eat, drink, and receive. Um, and again, we're back to um, the way that we commune for, our, for all the time before the pandemic, where we'll be making a circle around the altar. We'll come around and give you a piece of bread, an individual cup of wine or grape juice. The wine is the lighter color liquid. The grape juice is the darker color liquid. We also have gluten-free wafers available. If you need that, you can just let us know. Um, we'll serve you. You're welcome to eat and drink of the elements as you receive them. Then we'll collect your empty cup with our tray. And then um, you're welcome to hold hands with your neighbors as you feel comfortable doing so. And we'll offer you that blessing. And then following the blessing, you turn to your seats down the side aisle so people can continue to come forward down the center aisle. If you're not communing at this time um, you, and you would prefer to receive a blessing, we just ask you to fold your hands so that we can offer you a blessing. Um, and it is our practice to serve communion by first name. So if you don't have that name tag on, we may be asking you for your name. And that's everything you need to know. The table's been prepared, and all are welcome. <coughs>
Let us pray. Got too close one up. <laughs> Let us pray. Bread of life, you nourish our whole selves. You give abundantly. You are present among us. You have embodied the grace of God for us by your life, death, and resurrection. Help us to embody your life-giving grace for others, that all the world may be fed. Amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing song is the King of Glory. Are you singing all five of those verses? Verse three. Okay, just one through three? One yeah. through three. We'll be singing verses one through three. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. 